Welcome everybody to this third day of the roundtables of Decolonizing Italian Study. It's organized by Simone Brioni, uh, Mary Orton, me, Graziella Parati, and Gaoen Zhang. Um, I'm Graziella Parati. For those who don't know me, I'm a professor of Italian at Dartmouth College. I have joint titles in comparative religion, women's gender, and sexuality studies. Dartmouth College, I have to recognize, stands on the tribal lands of the Abenaki people. As you have already realized, we are recording the presentation and the discussion, and both will be made available. The speakers have 10 minutes to speak. I will introduce each of them before the presentation, and we will hold questions until after all the talks. Uh, some, all, or most of the presentations will appear as essays in a special issue of Italian studies in Southern Africa in 2022. And the issue will be an e-publication. So it is also possible that we will be adding as essays that were not presented here um, at the round tables. Um, I, before starting the session, I would like to thank Matthew Green for all his work efficiently and diplomacy in assisting the organizers. Uh, the, these roundtables are sponsored by the College of the Humanities at Brigham Young University and by the Leslie Center for the Humanities at Dartmouth College. Uh, one thing that you all have to remember, please send all your questions to me. I will mediate and ask the questions on your behalf. So I hope that I have remembered everything and my co-organizers can step in if I have forgotten anything. Otherwise, I'll go to the first speaker who is Joseph Viscomi, who teaches at the University of London Birbeck, or the other way around, teaches at Birbeck University of London. He is a lecturer in modern history who completed his PhD in anthropology and history at the University of Michigan. As a scholar raised in an Italian-American enclave in the Philadelphia, South Jersey area, he seeks to study the history of, migration, uh, of migrations sideways from perspective of departure, absence, and entropy. The title of this presentation is Against Nostalgia, Anti-Teleological Approaches to Migration in Italian Studies. Thank you for joining us, Joseph. Thank you for, for inviting me to join this conversation. Um, I want to begin by telling a story. Uh, I've been working for nearly a decade now on the departure of Italian residents from Egypt during the 20th century. Although the category Italiani di Gito currently refers to a very specific subset of a much larger community, I'm not particularly interested in the identitarian aspects of this population of migrants, but rather I'm concerned with understanding how this category of Italian and Mediterranean belonging or membership emerged and what it signifies. Why? And that's what I'm going to explain a little bit now. I began this project by accident. I was working on a labor history of Egyptian migrants in Italy, trying to understand something of the, um, the Mediterranean imaginary that was being used to explain the relationship between Egypt and Italy by hopeful migrants. There, in the midst of that work, I began to hear about how important the vast community of Italians was in shaping this Egyptian Mediterranean imaginary, especially when it could be used uh, against the growing xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment that was pervasive in the destination of many migrants. I fell deeply into the departure of the Italians from Egypt, looking at how a variety of Italian subjects, Jews, Catholics, wealthy merchant families from the Eastern Mediterranean, impoverished migrants escaping the destru destruction uh, of Messina, uh, Dodecanese Italians, and eventually Libyans, in different ways began to shape a quote unquote national community under the auspices of extraterritorial jurisdiction and fascist imperialism, just at the time that Egyptian nationalists worked to dismantle the structures that had buttressed uh, British and foreign supremacy in politics and the economy. During the 1930s, especially, the fascist regime invested heavily uh, in buttressing the Italians in Egypt, hoping on one hand to create a community of consensus, but on the other hand, oppose a real threat to British hegemony in the Mediterranean. Concurrently, they propped up through material and moral support, 
uh, militant Egyptian nationalist movements against the British and against the very legal regimes that permitted Italians to reside there. By 1945, the Italian nation empire collapsed uh, or began to, uh, and Egypt accelerated in the direction of national sovereignty with an end to extraterritoriality. And after the 1952 free officers coup, a new republic, uh, this diverse group of Italian residents had to make a choice. Those who wanted to remain Italian the way they, were, they had under the fascist nation empire needed to change something. And the vast majority left Egypt. Between 1946 and 1960, over 40,000 Italians left Egypt, some for other emigrant destinations, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, France, but for the most part to Italy, where having been denied formal recognition as repatriates initially, they would be qualified as refugees after 1960. In this departure, they formed, I argue, a political community. In other words, a community that was oriented towards a particular historical narrative about its place in Italian history, both metropolitan and imperial history. This is beyond the scope in a sense of today's talk. It would not be until the 1970s when emigration would take a central role in the life of Egyptians. Uh, and, but by this point, the Italian residents were very few, but signs of their community abounded. We know that in the Italian case, the flow of Egyptian migrants followed shortly the departure of Italians from Egypt, but does not reach large numbers until the 1980s or 1990s. Now, back to the present. I began to detail this history of departure through both oral history and archival research. What I found especially interesting while conducting research into the departure of Italians from Egypt, at the time I was living near Milan with a family of Egyptian immigrants from a town in the Delta, uh, were the distinctions between the perspectives of the rimpatriati, those who had returned, quote unquote, to Italy after the Second World War, and the Egyptian migrants. Each had divergent narratives of the, of the departures. Egyptians debated whether Nasser had expelled foreigners or whether they left on their own accord. Many articulated an idealistic kind of Egyptian hospitality that had welcomed Italians in Egypt. Indeed, this was used to stress the need for a kind of reciprocity in contemporary Italy, where they were facing increasing hardship in work and life as a migrant community, often collapsed in a broader category of North Africans or Muslims. Italian rimpatriati, on the other hand, discussed the privileged lives they led under the umbrella of British occupation and extraterritorial jurisdiction. They lamented the loss of the colonial Mediterranean. As with Egyptian immigrants, conversation would slide almost inevitably into debates about contemporary migration. This happened in several ways. First, they would refer to my presence. I was informed about what made the Italians in Egypt different from the Italians who went to the Americas. As an Italian American, I was told, look at what the Italians brought to the Americas, mafia, criminality, corruption, whereas in Egypt, we developed architecture, industry, infrastructure, et cetera. The narrative of the brava gente articulated, was articulated not in contrast to other colonial powers, but applied to reinforce a hierarchy within the history of migration. Uh, one particular migration that has its roots in imperial projects of Mussolini as much as Corradini and Crispi. The second way, looking beyond the past, a wider commentary is made on the state of politics of accoglienza and the reception of migrants in Europe. Few Italians from Egypt were sympathetic to the fate of contemporary migrants. Many were outright critical of those attempting to arrive on Italian shores. These two aspects often combined. In relation to contemporary migrants, for example, when Matteo Renzi drew a connection between Italy's history of emigration and the current arrival of immigrants, one Italiana di Gito complained, quote, what permits Renzi to, make, uh, to equate today's immigrants with our descendants? They worked hard, some more more than others, sure, but they contributed to the growth of the countries in which they arrived. Look how we left Egypt, shame on him, end quote. There was a deeply celebratory narrative that underpinned their sense of migration and history, but one that fit a narrative of the far and increasingly farther right. To conclude, while Egyptian migrants employed the historical narrative of Italian migration in Egypt to position themselves in relation to growing xenophobia and anti-immigrant settlement. Italian repatriates from Egypt were drawing upon that same historical narrative to place themselves within a hierarchy 
of Italian, European, and Mediterranean categories of belonging and rights to citizenship. I call this talk against nostalgia and anti-teleological approach to migration because I think it's important to understand how these dynamics play out in time. While well, there have been some books recently which draw on powerful metaphors for the relationship between the past and the present, I worry that our approach to contemporary manifestations of political membership and migration fall short of accounting for the kinds of complex hierarchies that are shaped in and emerge from these processes. We should not assume that the history of migration can be used to understand contemporary diversity and to combat, combat xenophobia. That would be to embrace a kind of nostalgia. But we should also seek to apprehend how it has been used to justify and support far-right anti-immigrant positions. This, I would argue, is as evident in the conservative turn of middle-aged Italian-American men witnessed in the last decades in the US as it is part of the story I'm telling here today about the post-war in contemporary Italy. Thus, I contend that an approach that attempts to understand as much the perspective of migrants as the longer durée processes through which political membership, even that which we might find repulsive, is necessary, is necessary as these are all interwoven in the history of Italian migration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, very, very interesting presentation, very provocative. Uh, we go to the second speaker. We have a little bit of a British invasion here because the person, the next person is uh, speaking from California, but actually she belongs to uh, St. Andrews University. I'm talking about Valerie Maguire. Uh, she is the author of the book, Italy Sea, Empire and Nation in the Mediterranean, 1895-1945, published by Liverpool Press. The book investigates Italy's colonization of Rhodes and other islands in the Aegean Sea. Her research emphasizes the intersection of migration with ideas of nation, race, and empire in the 20th century. The title of her presentation is The Mediterranean Alternative, A Blessing or a Curse for Diversity in Italian Studies. Thank you, Valerie. You're muted, you're muted there, Valerie. I don't know how Zoom does that to you. They know when you're not speaking to mute you. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you for the introduction, Graziella. I also wanna thank you, Matthew, for all of your hard work. I recently organized just a one day presentation and I know there's a lot that goes behind the scenes in, in terms of um, logistics. Um, I also want to say I'm really honored to be part of this conversation today, and I'm kind of going to come at it at the angle of thinking about it through um, Mediterranean studies. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pull up my, um, my kind of simple PowerPoint here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so, so yeah, I, I would like to start, if I can, kind of with a provocation, which is thinking about how this whole conversation about diversity comes at a time when we're also rethinking a lot of the ways our, our institutions are organized. And I'm specifically thinking about kind of one of our main organizational units, which is the Department of Italian, in our case, but any kind of national language. And I'm wondering too about asking a question about what it means to try and move beyond a nation centered frame. And yet still we need these, um, these departments, this tribalism of departments really supports us. And can we respect transnational and decolonial histories and at the same time maintain a, a unit that is our lifeline? Um, so how do we, how do we, can we relinquish? Do we want to relinquish the departmental model? at a time when Italian is so imperiled with declining enrollments, et cetera, you're familiar with the story. So um, what I'm, the title of my paper, The Mediterranean Alternative, refers in part to a 2010 essay by the geographers Paolo Giacaria and uh, Claudio Minca. In the essay, they build on the work of Ian Chambers and his uh, book, Mediterranean Crossess, to pr propose an alternative approach to scholarship in the Mediterranean, one that recognizes and concedes the fact that the Mediterranean is in essence a Eurocentric construction, but a construction that can nonetheless be revisited and excavated for other voices. 
On the other hand, the title of my paper, I think, is also referring to the idea that Mediterranean studies might in the future offer an alternative to Italian studies per se as a, as a field. So as the humanities moves beyond nation-centered frames, we are also faced with all of these new avenues, these new possibilities, transnational, post-colonial, and critical race studies. And I think though a big question mark kind of hovers around how Italian and Italian studies will play its part in shaping these other sub, sub disciplines. And I would like to offer the Mediterranean here today as a kind of example of the, both the perils and the possibilities of a movement in this direction. So if you do a quick Google search with the terms Mediterranean Studies University, you can see that a good number of institutions across the world are creating centers, consortiums, or degree programs in it. And this is just a screenshot from the University of Pittsburgh. The reasons for doing so seem to be sensible enough with the Mediterranean encompassing a vast range of disciplines and fields, and also seems to contain the possibility of making relevant the humanities. So as this program explains, the, the, at the University of Pitt, um, a student will learn about themes across the Mediterranean world over a broad chronological frame from antiquity to the present, and that the regional designation of the Mediterranean allows for an exploration of interconnectedness of North Africa, the Levant, Anatolia, Southern Europe, and the Balkans. And finally, I think the interesting thing is that this program may appeal to an academically inclined student who is not interested in an academic career per se. So help students prepare for international careers in administration, public policy and businesses, complements graduate study in policy and other traditional disciplines such as uh, literature and, and uh, cultural studies. So, um, so an interesting kind of movement in terms of branding and attracting enrollments. But as you can see from the screenshot um, that I supplied here, the advertisement for the certificate relies on a pretty or unoriginally a postcard cliche. Uh, I believe the photo is of Santorini, which is Greece's, probably Greece's most heavily touristed island. We are not seeing oh. your slides. I mean, we're seeing the beginning not huh. as a slideshow, but we don't see them moving on. So you probably have to go to slideshow and start from the beginning and then move okay. them on. All right, let me try again here. Yeah, can you see it now? This Yes. Okay, and if I go, oh, I see, but I'm like stuck. Yeah, but move the cursor from the center, okay, and then try to move it forward with the arrows. So do you see the next slide of Los Cuadrones Bianco? Okay, yes. so it's working. Okay, yeah. uh, so so anyway, Santorini, Greece's most heavily um, touristed island. So I think on the one hand, we can see, you know, this is just kind of what people decide to put on their website and it has maybe nothing to do with the intellectual rigor or desires that the faculty that are participating want to, to see in the initiative. But I think it's also consonant with the deeper trend of the Mediterranean to become entrapped in an essentializing, stereotypical, and even self-defeating discourse of location, of Mediterranean-ness, and of embodying a particular kind of imaginary. So I think, though, this is actually something that we're very familiar with in Italian studies, and it's here that Italianists can really contribute to kind of deconstructing and rethinking the Mediterranean. So for all the emphasis on connectivity and overlap that is proposed by a Mediterranean studies certificate, there seems to be um, little discussion of kind of the metaphorization that's at stake in the Mediterranean of globalism and global capitalism. And I can say more about this in the Q&A if anyone's interested. But just to say, as, as Roberto Dainotto has argued, liquidity, which is often the primary metaphor when it comes to the Mediterranean, conceals a fundamental asymmetry between European and non-European gazes. And yet I also believe there are many theoretical uh, points of departure that can be exposed by study of the Mediterranean. Indeed, I've just finished a book about it. Um, and that Italy's relationship to the Mediterranean can mean meaningfully contribute to the field's development or this umbrella field's development. And I, here I need to also recognize, for example, Joseph, who just gave the pre previous paper, who's been um, organizing a, a wonderful conference 
um, and series of symposiums about Italy and the Mediterranean, but there's also a lot of really great scholars out there that are, are working on Mediterranean studies and Italy, Italy's place within it. So I think that part of what we can do as scholars is think about Mediterranean as not just a regional frame um, or a set of histories, but as an actual heuristic, uh, which is something that Sharon Kinoshita at UCSC has really been developing, although interestingly it comes out of the, the Middle Ages. So in what follows, I wanna just talk about two very well-known films and how having the Mediterranean as a heuristic can in fact be a way of encouraging our students to study Italian culture from a perspective that fully um, understands Italy and its colonial and post-colonial context and helps them to kind of identify specific issues of race and difference that accompany these contexts. The two films that I have chosen feature often on our Italian syllabus studies syllabi, they could be part of a Mediterranean studies syllabi, and precisely because they are so teachable, I would say. So my critique of these is not to imply that we should discard them, but better how we could think about the Mediterranean to in bring the Mediterranean into our discussion of these films to teach them better. So the first film that is very often um, uh, taught is um, Augusto Giannina's 1936 film, Lo Squadrone Bianco, which is well known to be of one of Italy's seminal empire films. Shot on location in Libya, the plot of the film captures the real historical and eventually failed attempt of Italy to fully pacify the Bedouin populations of the Sahara Desert, which buffered uh, fascist Italy's coastal settlements in North Africa. And I wanna mention, I saw that David Atkinson is here in the audience and his kind of research on the, um, the extermination of the Bedouin populations, I'm always able to bring it in when I teach this film. Um, and the film also is also about Italian masculinity and fascist virilities more specifically. And its narrative has been widely read as the story of the protagonist Mario's journeys from an emasculated Italian man who invites his own demise by pursuing the quintessential Donna Crisi to a patriotic hero of the colonial forces. This transformation is, is achieved during male homosocial bonding that occurs when he is sent to the desert's interior to fight off the rebel indigenous forces. So the plot is very clear. Um, but there's been some more recent and intriguing readings of the film that have built on this kind of focus of the Sahara Desert in the, the film. Uh, as Ruth Bengia has argued, the Sahara not only signals Mario's, Mario's plunge into the oblivion, but also the Sahara's cleansing potential. The Sahara becomes a sacralized space, its mirages and endless hor silent horizons an entree into a transcendental realm, not only beyond women, but beyond the body sorry, as well. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, I have 30 seconds. Uh, to oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so I, my, my presentation, I'll just finish up Los Squadrona Bianco. And if anyone's interested, I can, um, also talk about Terra Ferma in the, which was my second film that I wanted to talk about. Um, so uh, there might be more to be said here though, if we bring in kind of Mediterranean reading of the film. So as Claudio Fogel has recently argued that the Mediterranean, um, the making of, this of the South during the unification was a separation of the Mediterranean from Italy. And so what happens in the film is that Mario is actually able to achieve kind of two wish fulfillments at once. He's able to reunite the North Africa to Italy during the course of his transformation into the desert. And he's also able to bury his own previous self uh, who is kind of this effeminized Southern, uh, Southern stereotype of a man. Um, so I'll just stop here. Um, I had more to say, but. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, there will be time during questions and answers to continue talking about the subject. I also want to say that I still have not received any questions on, on chat, and I would like to invite people to start doing that as we've already had two talks. Let me move to the third speaker. Uh, who is Loredana Polezzi from Stony Brook's Brook University. Her research interests combine translation studies and transnational studies. 
Rita Wilson. She is a co-editor of The Translator, and she's currently the president of the International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies. She was a co-investigator in the research projects, projects Transnationalism, uh, sorry, start again, Transnationalizing Modern Languages. And she's also one of the editors of Transnational Modern Languages series at LUP. The title of her presentation is D, in parenthesis, Colonial Memory and Linguistic Diversity, Reassessing What is Italian. Thank you, Loredana. Thank you, Graziella. And you can see why we kept calling it TML instead of all of that title for that project. Let me share my PowerPoint um, to begin with. And, and as I do this, uh, let me also um, thank, is it going? Yeah, it is going to that. Okay. Are you seeing just my um, one slide at present? No, we're seeing two, Loredana. Okay. Why is it doing that? Uh, let's go back. I'm seeing two. I mean, the one that is at the center was bigger is very visible. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, but like this, you end up seeing too, too many at a time, but it, does, it doesn't really matter. Let me just see if I can get the slideshow through this way from beginning. No, you're still doing, you're still seeing two for some reason. Uh, it, it's, sorry, I'm, it, it's, a, it's a brand new computer because mine died last week, so I, I'll, I'll, um, you'll have to live with seeing too, and you'll get a little anticipation, I suppose, of what is coming, of what is coming. Not next. a problem, not a problem. Um, well, let me first of all start by, by thank you, thanking again the, the organizers for what is proving already uh, to be a, a, a fantastic series of, um, of roundtables and talks, so much so that, that the one from yesterday kept me awake last night. So I, I literally was still buzzing with some of the discussion. And since I am speaking from campus, uh, let me also acknowledge that I am indeed speaking from the stolen lands of the Sivakot people, Wapawag, also known as Stony Brook. Now, this is not gonna be a research paper as such. It is based indeed on research that I've been doing over the past few years and I continue to do, but it's more a series of reflections on the questions that bother me, that indeed keep me awake um, at night. Um, but also that keep me engaged in what I do at present and keep me thinking about what it is that, that we do um, in Italian studies and, and beyond Italian studies. This is the third event um, in as many weeks which I attend and which is devoted to uh, diversity, decolonization and the renewal of the Italian studies and or the modern languages curriculum. And of course, this is um, not in itself a coincidence. It is not a coincidence um, because yes, there has been fantastic work that um, has been done over the years, especially, well, at least the last two decades, I would say probably more than that in these areas, in areas of um, the colonial, post-colonial, decolonial studies and Italian studies and modern languages as a whole. And, and more broadly in uh, diversity and, and uh, inclusivity. But there is still a lot of work to do. And we have to be honest, I think, with ourselves and know that the catalyst over the last year has clearly come not necessarily from academia, but it has come, of course, from social action. It has come from activism. It has come from the streets, in particular from the BLM movement, but also from many other movements that we have seen before and during the COVID pandemic. And this, of course, as, as an academic, um, you know, this explosion of the question of diversity and inclusivity, thanks to social action. As an academic, to an extent, it, um, it saddens me because we weren't advanced enough, because we, we haven't been doing enough. But at the same time, as someone who believes very firmly in activism and social action, it also reassures me, um, reassures me that, that we can also be led by uh, and be connected with um, what is happening at the level precisely of activism. So what I want to do in the next few minutes in the few minutes that I have is to try to think about the intersection between uh, regimes of visibility of which Vetri was, was talking yesterday, of course, and, and also regimes of invisibility because those always go together. 
but also regimes of audibility. Um, and Maya, but also Mark, were talking about this on, on the first day. I also want to continue the reflections that we have been having um, be about methodological nationalism, um, which is at the heart of the disciplines that we have inherited and which, which still somehow profess as members of the profession. And on the other uh, side, indeed, transnational approaches and more diverse approaches, uh, post-colonial approaches, decolonial approaches amongst them. I also want to link that and this image, which is courtesy of Serena, it's Serena Bassi, another of the speakers from next week, and a dear friend and, and colleague, um, as, as are many um, in this audience. Um, I am lucky to hold many as friends and, and colleagues. Um, it, it was Serena who first um, forwarded this to me. And, and this image has been really something that has resurfaced in my own consciousness constantly for the past year, year and a bit. Um, so I, I want to think, um, as I was saying about these regimes, but also how they connect with mono or multi, pluri, poly, my favorite is polylingual if I have to choose, um, uh, um, dispositions. I'm using the word disposition, which is the one that um, Suresh Kanagaraja uses. He talks about monolingual or multilingual, um, but again, the, there are other um, prefixes we can use there, uh, dispositions. And how these connect to the question of who and what is Italian, but also of who and what um, we teach Italian for. Now, I will return to this question shortly, but I want to start first again with the story. And that story is um, a story that connects the, the project, the TML project, so I will not try to pronounce that, that title again, um, with uh, my own current teaching practice at Stony Brook. I arrived only at the end of January. I literally am finishing today after this talk my first semester here, it's been my first experience teaching a new group of students, a new cohort um, of students. And of course, I have not met any one of them face to face, but um, that's another story. Now, in a course about the Italian American experience, I wanted students to think about how objects tell stories, tell stories about migration, um, generational, intergenerational, um, and a personal, collective, and so on. And I used to do that a selection of the photographs which Mario Badagliacca, who was the artist in residence for the uh, TML project, produced for um, a, a series called Italy is Out. I told my students that Mario had gone to three locations. He had gone to London and the surroundings, to New York and the surroundings, including Long Island, uh, where, where we were talking from, and to Buenos Aires and the surroundings. And then I showed them a number of photographs with the three objects which Mario had asked every um, uh, sort of um, person who was being photographed to take with them, um, objects that would narrate, tell something about their story. Um, and I asked, I didn't show them the, the, the text that went with each of the photographs of the triptychs, and they almost look like a a predella and um, pala d'altare and predella when you put them together. Um, I, I didn't give them the, the text. I just asked them to imagine their stories. Now, with many of the photographs, they didn't have much of a difficulty. They came up with something which was quite close, which was suitably similar to what the actual biographies, the actual narrations of these uh, individuals were. But this one completely threw them. Remember, these are um, students at Stony Brook. They are themselves extremely diverse. Uh, they're the most diverse group probably I've ever taught uh, by disciplinary background, as well as personal um, uh, sort of back and family background identification and so on. But when it came to this uh, photograph, although I had told them what I've just told you about um, the project, the story that the group looking at this image came up with was that this was an American who had moved to Italy and had fallen uh, in love with Tuscany. The possibility of a black Italian was simply not conceivable. And this is for a group who is in itself extremely diverse in ethnicity, religion, background, and all the rest as I said. Now this for me poses some really interesting questions. There's a question of reciprocity 
I know Simone has been working on Genevieve Macapini's book on Traiettore di Sguardi, and Kumbola Ramadani Musa was reminding me the other day of the notion of the boomerang gaze, which Maria Lugones uses in a book that, that Kumbola and myself and, and, and Kumbola's sister, Alessandra Tanezini, were reading together last summer during the, 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 the first lockdown. So there is a question of reciprocity. The invisibility of um, racialized Italian bodies then is reflected also in their invisibility through the eyes of others. And what I have found is that I have had to push and push and push my students to go beyond certain images of Italy. Images that are, and again, we need to acknowledge that this, I think, linked, yes, to um, a racialized um, erasure that is part of Italy's past but also linked to current regimes, economic regimes, post-capitalist regimes, which sell knowledge and heritage as a very important currency. And therefore peddle the images at the bottom of this, the images of Tuscany, you know, of, 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 um, of cathedrals and um, Gothic cathedrals and, and sunflower fields, but do not necessarily project other images of Italy. Now we, I think, need to acknowledge that we also complicit. Well, Dana, you have all, you have thirty okay. seconds to wrap up. Okay, I will finish very quickly. We are complicit in these issues, and we are complicit also through the issue of language, through not speaking more about multilingualism. This photograph, which I want to return to, is really important because it puts language and the racialized bodies side by side, but also Italian next to the other colonial languages. So it takes away that innocence that comes with the minoritization. I want to finish with a provocation. We need to rethink the discipline. And I said at the Berkeley event, what Mark Chu said here the other day, how do we defend and rethink the discipline at the same time? One thing I want to hold on to is the notion of language, not necessarily Italian, not hegemonic Italian, not a standard Italian, uh, a translanguage in Italian. But I don't want our flag of diversity and diversification to become the fig leaf for further arrogant Anglo-centric exclusiveness, as if we go from target language only to no language, because English is a language. And the thing that, um, that sort of uh, I rejoice about is that my students are getting it. I want to just finish by sharing two slides by two of my students who are student teachers. One of them went from un italiano vero, foto di Fultunio, to Salmo, un vero italiano. Odio la chiesa ma sono un cristiano, credo di essere un vero italiano, cerca di essere umano. And the other one ended her presentation last Monday with this quotation from a um, PhD done at, at um, CUNY. Italian, does the label require citizenship, genealogy, or is mere self identification enough? We need to ask these questions more and more, but we need to ask them while also continue to ask the question about languaging. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, you were saying something else? I heard a voice, but anyway. Um, Not me. Oh, okay, all right. So let's move on to the fourth speaker, who is Akash Tumar. Uh, Akash teaches at Indiana University. His research focuses on 13th and 14th century Italian literature, especially Dante, from in, an interdisciplinary perspective, uh, such as history of science, Mediterranean studies, and world literature. Uh, some of his recent works include the essay Walls of Inclusivity, Dante's Divine Comedy and World Literature, and another article titled Appreciating the Whole Dante Now. The title of his presentation today is Dante, Poet of the Decolonized World. Thank you, Akush. Akash. Thank you so much, Graziella. And Thank you to all of the organizers. Thank you to Matthew, especially for putting together such a wonderful and insightful array of roundtables. As Vetri said yesterday, I have learned a great deal. Uh, my thanks also to my colleagues of the Cosmopolitan Collective, uh, formed in the tumult and outrage of last summer. Our reading and thinking together has given me much in conceiving such a project. 
Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and jump into a slideshow. Uh, and before I formally begin, I want to acknowledge and honor the Miyamiyaki, Lenape, uh, Bodwedwadmik, uh, and Sawanwa people on whose ancestral homelands and resources Indiana University Bloomington is built. So in these remarks, I take my cue from a line in Bugi Wathiongo's 1986, Decolonizing the Mind, quote, the bullet was the means of the physical subjugation, language was the means of the spiritual subjugation, end quote. And indeed, I find inspirational, I continue to find inspirational how Gugi put English aside in favor of Reagan and Kikuyu, uh, a project that continues even now in his new work that experiments with epic form, The Perfect Nine. Summer reading beckons for all of us, I hope. For me, defining Dante's language and its heredity, I'm gonna use Loredana's word now as translanguaging, is precisely what is at stake in considering how we might decolonize our own minds and certain aspects of our discipline, especially those rooted in a more distant past. Decolonizing Dante means opening our reading of the poem to global and cross-cultural currents. By doing so, we might extricate another kind of poet from the one that has been adopted as father of a nation, language, and culture. As Eric Auerbach termed Dante poet of the secular world, I term him poet of the decolonized world. For I believe that there is a link between the theological and the nationalistic, ideologies that work by narrowing the horizons, defining by means of borders and boundaries. That is not to say I'm set against nation or faith, rather that they might, they do, overdetermine our ways of reading. As Theo Barolini has sought to de-theologize de Dante, I believe that we can decolonize the Somo Poeta. We might consider affinities with world authors, not in the vein of source study, but with an expanded approach to the era in which Dante lived. Of late, I've been reading Dante in concert with 14th century Indian poet Amir Khusro. We might interrogate more fully the presence of the medieval Mediterranean hybrid language, see Vetrina Tan and Paba and hybridity, uh, references to trade routes, at people across the globe uh, and consider tensions between local rootedness and the cultivation of an unmoored global self throughout Dante's corpus. It was quite telling to me uh, that Theresa May in an October 2016 speech at the height of Brexit debates proclaimed, quote, but if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what citizenship means, end quote. May seemed to be speaking to the elite uh, but her remarks, of course, implicate the thrall of nationalism, and they fly in the face of Dante's expanded notion of citizenship, one that holds it up as a virtue but shifts the paradigm of kivitas to encompass a more diversified composition. Nos autem qui mundus es patria, velut piscibus equor. Uh, to me, however, the whole world is a homeland as the ocean is to fish, writes Dante in De Vulgari Eloquencia. Kwame Anthony Appiah, in response to May, writes, quote, real cosmopolitanism is not a privilege, it is an obligation. It does not belong to the rarefied circles of some frequent flyer upper class. It belongs to anyone who cares about global justice, about the environment, about the alleviation of strife and carnage beyond our immediate national borders, end quote. In this regard, when Dante sees home as Morocco at the end of Purgatorio IV, when Beatrice tells him that he will be, quote, Cive di quella Roma onde Cristo è Romano, end quote, in Purgatorio 32, when he speaks to Charles Bartel about global citizenship in Paradiso 8, he is embodying this sense of cosmopolitanism. I believe he also does so in the radical space of Limbo in Inferno 4, which holds not just the luminaries of the Greco Roman tradition, but also three Muslims, Salah ad Din, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, or Saladino, Avicenna, Averroe. This is not to say that narrow and inflammatory positions are not taken up all along the poem. For in Averroe, there's also the treatment of Muhammad in Inferno 28, verses declaimed by Salvini uh, as justification for his anti-immigrant Islamophobia. For the walls of Limbo's castle that stand to let the world in, there are Brunetto and Cacciaguida, Inferno 15, Paradiso 15 to 17, who promote blood purity and stricter borders to keep non-Florentines out. But these global, expansive, entangled moments, one that, ones that might be termed as decolonizing, merit further emphasis in our moment. We cannot confine such considerations to modernity alone. I'd like to suggest two ways of embodying this approach. First, a brief expansion on my Purgatorio 4 Morocco reference, then a couple of pedagogical thoughts 
that might take these Dantean insights outward to formulating a more nuanced approach to the teaching of medieval Italian literature. I believe that we can read the end of Purgatorio IV in light of the critical perspective of Neil Lazarus's local cosmopolitanism. On the one hand, it has the intensely local and personal flair of a reunion with Dante's Florentine friend Bellacqua, a maker of musical instruments defined by his endearing laziness. On the other hand, at the very end of the canto, Virgil's reminder that we, the climb must go on in the form of a time check. It is noon here and night is falling on Morocco. In the reunion with Bellacqua, there is sweetness and playful banter. He calls Dante out for his exhaustion at the climb. Dante calls him out for his laziness. Uh, and Bellacqua hits the nail on the head and jabbing at Dante's insatiable curiosity to know how things work. Bellacqua's was a young death and, his, and this reunion, like those with other friends in Purgatorio, Casella, Forese, is a way for Dante to go home to, Flor to the Florence that he has lost through exile. But the shift to a planetary perspective at the end of the canto is a telling one. It is a return to the language of Ulysses' travel, our second and final mention of Morocco in the Commedia. E già il poeta innanzi mi saliva e dicea, vienne o mai, vedi che tocco meridian dal sole, e alla riva copre la notte già col pie Morocco. Being on the other side of the world has a curious effect. We have to account for jet lag, calculate time relative to our present position, and the home that we've left behind. Oh, how I miss traveling. But that home is not named Florence uh, or any of the very specific Italian toponyms that we have encountered earlier in the canto to illustrate the difficulty of the mountain climb. Instead, it is a place on the other side of the Mediterranean. In the embrace of travel and necessary breaking of his cultural horizons, perhaps Dante has found a new home in Morocco and the sea that bathes it. This sort of Mediterranean mingling should push us to reformulate the birth of Italian poetry. When I teach a survey of medieval and, Italian and Renaissance literature, I like to begin with the 11th, 12th century Siculo Arab poet Ibn Hamdis. What you're seeing uh, on the left is a page from Francesca Maria Corrao's Poeti Arabi di Sicilia, in which she had contemporary Italian poets translate select poems of medieval Arab poets of Sicily. First published in 1987, just a year after decolonizing the mind, it is a compelling attempt to forge a dialogue that is both cross-cultural and across time. The stunning nostalgia, though that can be problematized, as we've heard, uh, that Ibn Hamdis feels as he looks back to the Sicily that he was forced from, allows us to appreciate the layers of history, culture, and language that are felt even in subsequent Norman and Hohenstaufen periods of Sicily's medieval identity. And on the right, you see uh, an image of the Capella Palatina. And a poet closer to Dante's own moment, who both venerates and critiques him from another cultural perspective, Emmanuel of Rome. By having students read his sonnet, Amor non lesse mai l'Ave Maria, we might expose the discomfort with the still novist blending of Christian theology and courtly love. We might also dwell on Manuelo as a writer of Hebrew poetry, the first to take the form of the sonnet into a language neither Sicilian nor Tuscan, and you see an example of that on the right. These pedagogical acts of decentering, privileging the existence and experience of cultural others enrich the study of medieval Italian. They emphasize that current interests that we have in migration and intersectional identity are by no means foreign to the medieval world. And Valerie rightly named Sharon Kinoshita in thinking about these issues. To the contrary, such readings ask us to rethink even the most basic assumptions of what Italy and Italian are. And so by thinking Dante is poet of the decolonized world, I hold that we live up to those moments of the Commedia that celebrate hybrid language, cultural mingling, global understanding. We resist that spiritual subjugation called out by Gugi a generation ago, for it is antithetical to the vision of the Poema Sacro. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much for also being so on time. This is absolutely amazing. And so I can move on to the fifth speaker today, last but not least, of course, um, who is uh, uh, Rosetta Giuliani Caponetto, who teaches at Auburn University. Her areas of academic interest include Italy's colonialism in East Africa, the Italian-American diaspora, food movement, and activism. She's one of seven faculty advocates for the multidisciplinarity, uh, no, for the multidisciplinary outreach, teaching and research initiative, fostering communities in the kitchen and garden. I am highly intrigued by this uh, group. Um, and, and I'm ashamed to say I didn't know it. The title of the presentation today is The Transformative Impact of Italian Studies. Thank you, Rosetta. Thank you, Graziella. 
And um, so I send warm greetings to the organizers for the uh, kind invitation, uh, to the audience for convening and making our conversation valuable, and to my fellow panelists, to Joseph Wiscomi, Va Valerie Maguire, Loredana Polezzi, and Akash Kumar. And I must admit that coming after your presentation it is so uplifting, and this is going to be very technical, so please forgive me for that. I work for one of the academic institutions in Alabama, Auburn University, a land grant institution that under the Morrill Act pledged a commitment to use the federal land it was granted for the economic growth of the region through academic curricula that provide practical skills as well as agricultural and mechanical knowledge. And so agriculture and engineering are the mainspring of the university. A fall 2020 article in Inside Higher Ed underscore that with African Americans making 20 up, uh, up uh, uh, making up 26 percent of the residents in Alabama, Auburn University has struggled to have adequate representation of the black, uh, black population on campus, which stalled at five percent. And over the years, several committees have tried to increase the inflow of black students, including the 2020 Task Force for Opportunity and Equity. Among the many questions that have been raised and will be raised by this conference, I will focus on two. How can the field of Italian studies engage with institutional priorities that have a local urgency and significance, such as fulfilling the university's commitment to the economic the well-being of their surrounding communities. How can Italian studies be relevant to our institutions' efforts to increase underrepresented populations in their st student body? And my short um, uh, talk draws upon uh, the meaning of the term transformative, which is very, uh, it's a buzzword uh, uh, these days. So from the Latin trans, which means beyond, and formare, which means to form, transformative carries the idea of form as expandable in so that the shape or structure of something can be changed beyond its original purpose or vision. Um, and so um, the, the project that I share with you is named uh, Fostering Fostering Communities in the Kitchen and Garden and embraces the meaning of transformative in the sense that makes the field of Italian studies stay relevant and promotes its transformation and allows the field to be an advocate for transformation, for change. The Fostering Communities is an interdisciplinary outreach, teaching and research initiative meant to provide foster youth with cooking skills, nutrition education, horticultural training and digital narrative techniques. And this program engages young adults who leave the foster care system and transition to independent living. Specifically, the program empowers them with life skills and practical tasks. It encourages career exploration in nutrition, cooking, horticulture, and agricultural sciences and shows how these careers are connected to disciplines such as journalism, Italian, and social work. And when I say connected, I mean connected in terms of career pathways. And more importantly, the project promotes the participants exposure to college opportunities and intends to provide academic advising for foster youth interested in pursuing vocational degrees or college. So fostering communities, and I uh, repeat, is a community engaged research based program in teaching um, initiative developed by a team of seven faculty, and I will uh, name the I will list their names and also their fields, and I will explain why after. So Carolyn Robinson in horticulture, John Harold in journalism, Onikia Brown in nutrition, Jennifer Jetner and Danielle Werner in social work, and Chipea Thomas in the uh, university outreach office. And so not only to give them credit, of course, I'm um, you know, uh, sharing their names, but also to give a sense of the size of the team, of a team involved in a project 
that has several layers of complexity, but also because I'm super grateful that this team believed in an idea that originated in the field of Italian studies. Um, most importantly, um, most importantly, Fostering Communities aims to provide a platform for a humanities lab oriented course that will have a service learning component. Um, so this course or lab will be cross-listed with programs within the College of Agriculture, the College of Human Sciences, and this is the college where hospitality management and nutrition uh, are housed and the College of Liberal Arts. And this past April, uh, we invited the two co-directors of the Humanities Lab uh, of Arizona State University to give us an insight into their program. Um, and you can see uh, Dr. Vitullo and Dr. Spitzer on the flyer here. And so for those of us who are not familiar with the concept of Humanities Lab, this is a program that brings together disciplines in the humanities and in the sciences to offer innovative undergraduate and graduate courses or labs in which outreach teaching and research are in conversation to seek solution to impending societal challenges. Um, and so during this, um, their presentation, uh, they discussed the strategies for recruiting students to the humanities report. And I know that many of you are already familiar. Uh, so uh, this is just a repetition. This is a 2021 report from the National Humanities Alliance that came out uh, in spring uh, 2021. And uh, they talked about uh, the Humanities Lab. They, their, their main argument was that Humanities Lab is really a tool that um, is capable, it's, it's aligned with some of the strategies. And uh, number one, uh, able to clarify what humanities are. And so what they said, what they shared with us is that, um, that um, the three of um, uh, most common misconceptions that shared by students and parents is that they don't really understand what the humanities are beyond the traditional uh, way of conceiving them. Uh, they really don't understand which uh, career uh, path uh, humanities can, uh, somebody that obtains a, a degree in humanities can pursue. And they don't understand also what type of skills the humanities are able to build. Um, so this is a, a, length, uh, a lengthy um, uh, report, it's over uh, 80 pages, but you can also have a snapshot um, of, the, of the report by reading the, um, this article that came out in March 8, on March 8, 2021, um, that also um, kind of is a summarizing some of the main topics that are addressed in the report. And I want to share with you this particular comments um, from Paula Krebs, uh, um, who is executive director of the Modern Language Association. So she says, this focus on career possibilities is above all an equity issue if humanities programs want to recruit students of color. Pell Grant recipients and first generation uh, college goers. And she keeps um, you know, talking about the, the fact that otherwise humanities, um, we give the, imp the impression that humanities is kind of a luxurious track for students who are not really um, in a rush to find employment. Um, so I don't have time to describe what is my contribution uh, to the uh, project that I shared with you, uh, but uh, maybe I can, I can do it later uh, in the Q&A. Um, in conclusion, Fostering Communities is an outreach teaching and research initiatives that brings um, Italian studies to the forefront when promoting the advancement of diversity, food justice, food security, mental wellness, rural communities, and food philanthropy on campus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosetta. We are exactly on time. We have 30 minutes for questions. Um, one thing that I would like to say that is that we, um, the organizing group, will take a few days break 
and start again with these round tables in uh, with other three additional round tables starting on Monday, uh, and Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. So it will be Monday the 10th of, uh, of this month. I look forward to seeing you all again. Uh, the panel on Monday is devoted to transnationalizing Italian studies. It will be moderated by Matthew Green. Uh, so let's start with the questions that people are asking. Uh, this is a question for um, um, Joseph Viscomi and uh, Valerie McGuire. Uh, is Mediterranean studies replicating the tourist imperial vision at the core of its current in, uh, intellectual educational enterprise, especially for tourist and neo-colonial students and as it is presented by some programs? How does this reorganization respond to the needs of the neoliberal university? Joseph. So Joseph or Valerie, you decide who goes first. I was hoping you would go. <laughs> so okay, I, Valerie, I, I can... you are being volunteered. Yeah, um, I, I can, I mean, I can make a comment. I think that was part of the point of my paper is that I think that there's this huge risk of exactly that, of reproducing this tourist imperial imaginary. And I mean, I think part of it has to do with how kind of desirable people, universities believe study abroad programs can be um, and how much they can kind of, I also liked what Laura Donna was mentioning about this kind of, you know, knowledge and heritage tradition of the university. Um, thinking about how then the Mediterranean is also kind of embedded in this knowledge and heritage. And, and the two films that I chose, I think are good examples of how this, can, this whole process can be reversed um, since they both think about kind of tourist imaginaries of, is kind of one subtext of the film, um, the location of the Sahara in Los Squadron, Squadrone Bianco, and then also in Terraferma, kind of Lampedusa as a holiday destination. And so can there be opportunities to use that, um, you know, can, to have a kind of critical discussion about kind of this tourist imperial imaginary. I don't feel I'm in the position to kind of say to, you know, any kind of department, you know, you need to do these things differently. I mean, I think that's, I just wanted to introduce this as, you know, people, you know, as these programs come into being more and more, what kind of, you know, what kind of um, ideas can we bring to reshaping it at their conception? Joseph, what would you like to add? Um, I mean, I, I, I agree, I think, with everything that Valerie just said. I don't have very much to add uh, apart from, I mean, I, I've not taught at an institu institution that has the resources to run one of those study abroad programs, but uh, I, teach, uh, I teach Mediterranean studies from, from the classroom, and, and I think uh, I, I like this idea about approaching it as a heuristic, and, and I, I also tend to approach the Mediterranean as a way of dismantling, I think, some of these ideas about uh, methodological nationalism that, um, that come uh, inherently with the, with the field, with the, with our, also with our disciplinary approaches. Um, and I use it also coming at this from the perspective of, of Middle East studies as well. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of resistance that to the idea of Mediterranean studies as being simply another kind of Orientalist or European imposition. Uh, but I, I tend to say, well, you know, the, the Mediterranean studies has the potential actually to invert uh, um, all of the disciplinary or, or area studies frameworks and in actually a very positive way if we embrace it uh, as as including that complexity and um, and this again I think is part of my kind of anti nostalgia framework is I think that it's important to acknowledge that the the, the Mediterranean itself uh, subverts those categories if we really allow ourselves to think with it and and thus I think as as a teaching um, uh, it, the Mediterranean works really as a teaching strategy for for. Um, for some of these broader questions, I'll, I'll stop there. Right, you're right, Joseph. I mean, inherently, nostalgia has no future. 
because it only looks back. Uh, Loredana, you had your hand up. Would you want to speak and uh, answer? I, I, yes and no, in the sense that, 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 in fact, you know, Joseph has just said some of the things that I, that I wanted to say, because it's not just the, the, the programs abroad, it's, it's in our classrooms again. It, it, you don't have to go to Italy or to the Mediterranean to encounter these things. The only thing I wanted to say is that because of, you know, of um, I, I, I skipped one slide, which was only a, it was only a provocation, it was only a butad, but it speaks to what Valerie mentioned, that, that question of the knowledge and heritage. I had a slide which was taken from La Dolce Vita of um, Anita Eppert and, and Marcello Masriani in the Fontana di Trevi. And that's because I keep thinking about this. You know, what am I asked to do when I'm teaching Italian studies? Um, and it, it's always been the case in the UK, now in the US. Am I selling that image of Italy yet again that people see as desirable again, as, as both Valerie and, and Joseph said? Am I selling that nostalgia? Am I double selling that nostalgia when it's two Italian Americans, for instance? And so I have now kept, I keep thinking of, um, of La Dolce Vita on the one hand, but then the tormentone in my head and other things that keep me up at night has become Toto Truffa 62 and Toto literally selling the Fontana di Trevi to, and I remembered it in my head, I remembered it as him selling the Colosseo to an American tourist. When I went to look at it again, it's much better. He's selling the Fontana di Trevi, that of La Dolce Vita, to an Italian American returnee. So, you know, go deconstruct that. <laughs> So, Can I just add uh, something very quickly? Yes. So I, I think that there's a way to do this right, right? I mean, I think that, and especially learning other languages, I studied Arabic, that, that goes a long ways in, in actually doing Mediterranean studies in, in, a, in a more constructive way. And, and I think the pre-modern is, is essential um, in, in dismantling this kind of tourist imperialism and thinking about actual points of connection and contact across centuries as opposed to in the, the 20th and 21st centuries. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to a question for Rosetta. This is a rather provocative question. And, and I want to say to the person who asked the question is that I did try to involve men in mentoring junior faculty at Dartmouth. Uh, expanding a very long-standing group of women who had done a lot of mentoring and the, 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 the men really refused to do that. So the question is, are males excluded by design from the project? Isn't it problematic to see only pictures of women association with kitchen and garden? Uh, I, I like to think that it's just a coincidence. Um, but honestly, as I was, um, we were talking about the project with our deans who are also women, um, they were not surprised that um, uh, the team was uh, made of uh, uh, female faculties because they are, uh, as they said, uh, as they said it, um, more willing to invest their time and they were generous with their time. Um, and so in projects like this, really, um, you may get um, a, a research piece out of, out of it, uh, but this has been, the, the, the team came together three years ago um, and uh, in three years, uh, we invested a lot of time, but really uh, everything is about uh, teaching and outreach and uh, just a little bit about research. And so who is willing to invest that time and not get out of something out of it? So that, that is my diplomatic uh, response. <laughs> so thank you, Rosetta. Uh, I appreciate the diplomacy. Um, uh, there is an observation, it's not a question, but just a comment, and so any on the panel can respond to it. Ian Chambers' idea that the Mediterranean as a European concept dates from the 19th century is certainly tied to the posit positivist drive toward categorization with significant consequences for colonial and post-colonial analysis. But it is equally important to recognize that as the archeologist Cyprian Broadbank has examined in his book, The Making of the Middle Sea a History of the Mediterranean from the beginning to the emergence of the classical world, the idea of the Mediterranean as a geographical, social and cultural matrix 
is hardly new. So anybody would like to comment on this or no? Uh, we can move on to the next. Can I just say I agree wholeheartedly and, and, and Broodbank's work is fantastic. And, and this, this is precisely the point of, of needing to transhistoricize and, and not limit ourselves to the here and now. Okay, so I have a question for Loredana. Uh, con i miei studenti e studentesse trattiamo il tema della migrazione dall'Italia, sia dal punto di vista storico che contemporaneo e verso l'Italia. Leggiamo e discutiamo letteratura di scrittrici e scrittori di origine migrante che scrivono in italiano. Fino ad ora abbiamo approfondito soprattutto gli aspetti culturali e interculturali, le narrazioni del processo... Uh, del crearsi di una presenza in Italia. Ascoltando la tua presentazione mi chiedo se sia ancora appropriato parlare di autori e autrici di origine migrante o se dobbiamo presentarli come autrici e autori italiani e leggere e discutere testi che non presentano temi di immigrazione e integrazione in particolare, ma come esempi di lingua italiana contemporanea. Cosa ne pensi? Um, tutte e due le cose, both, <laughs> both and, and more than that. But, but more than that, it, it's about this question, A, it, it's, uh, it's about this complexity of these networks, you know, transhistorical, translingual. It's about not thinking of, you know, it's, it's about something that, that Elia and Maya were, were talking about um, eloquently over the last two days. You know, to whom does Italian belong? Um, I, one of the things um, that I, I but, but, but as part of the, the PML project, all of us have been trying to do is to push this idea that, for instance, certain labels are really not useful for us. So uh, I now systematically, unless I, I, I do so historically, again, you know, between citing and so on, I systematically never use the label modern foreign language or foreign language. Languages are never foreign. Languages are always already here. They're always already mixed. Again, you know, Akash's point. Um, then, and, and also equally, I don't want to talk about native speakers. Imagine talking about native speakers in a case such as Italy, where, and again, we've heard already about this over the last few days, not all natives are natives, okay? So you can be native and still not recognized as native. So you're native speaker of the language. You may be actually a native speaker of the vernacular, as Elia was talking about yesterday, of a particular location that is still not perceived as uh, owning that language. So I think, you know, Graziella, you've written about this more than anybody else in this room, probably. Those labels, any of these labels are useful only as far as they go. Uh, the famous James Clifford thing, you know, all these, these terms, he was talking about travel, translation, they're tainted terms. They take us a certain way and then they fall apart. Let's let them apart. Students are fantastically prepared and equipped for it. They react wonderfully when you open those gates. I already stole Paolo Frasca. I wrote to Paolo after his, his talk the other day and I said, Paolo, I have literally serendipity. I have stolen one of your slides because I needed something to show these students how you can still be Italian American and celebrate that without being stuck in the constraints of that mold. And so I stole that wonderful uh, slide with the two poems and the students loved it. And, and I thanked him for it. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's let them fall apart. <laughs> it's the only answer I would have. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you so much for uh, Loredana and uh, thank you also for everybody who's still sending in questions. We have a question for Akash. How does your interpretation differ from the traditional notion that real literature is universal? So, I, yes, I, I think universalism is, is a trap. <laughs> uh, and for me, it's very important to, to specifically ground a, a reading of, of, of a text like the Commedia uh, in, in, in the details, in, in, the, actual, in the actual moments uh, that, say, uh, Morocco is evoked in, in thinking about the dynamics of, of textual interaction and, uh, and, and in doing so, not just saying this is, this is all here for anyone and everyone to read, but specifically thinking and, and historicizing uh, what that they sense of cultural otherness was uh, and, and how 
Sometimes uh, his representation is heterodoxical. Uh, sometimes it's it's incredibly uh, homogeneous and and reductive and orthodox. Uh, and and coming away with a more balanced perspective uh, that that allows such points to emerge. So Akash, don't go anywhere because I have a question for you again. Um, uh, the uh, the person is asking, well, is observing that you are the only medievalist and early modernist on the panels this week. Um, so the person wonders if Akasha sees a different set of challenges facing medievalist and early modernist who wish to decolonize research teaching as compared to colleagues working on modern and contemporary Italy. Well, that, that's Great good. Question. Yes. Uh, I I think it, I think it is different. Uh, I I think that there's at least a tendency for uh, for people have to have more formed ideas of 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 the Middle Ages of of the of the pre modern uh, past uh, and and there and it's just more more ossified as far as a as a structure as a hierarchy as a genealogy goes uh, and so it's more difficult to to get people to unthink a little bit. Uh, at the same time, once you get people reading and, 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 and engaging with materials of the, of the pre-modern, uh, it, it's very easy to dispel and dismantle uh, some of those hierarchies. It's just a question of getting people to, to do it and to buy in. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Rosetta. Uh, what, it, it, it's a common end question. What a wonderful example you are providing. Um, it is an example that we can and should be doing both. Criticize our discipline, be critical and aware of our own biases and shortcomings and trying to build bridges and engage with other disciplines in our own institution. It is not an, an either or, it is a both and. Would you like to comment on this? Not really a question, but a comment, yes. Uh, it, uh, yes, I, I totally agree, it's, it's, it's both. And uh, my presentation, and I didn't have time to, you know, kind of expand because of time constraint, but that's the, 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 really the target is being able to do what we like to do, but also being able to make connections uh, considering what is the local uh, scenario, especially for programs who are very, very, that are very, very little, and there is not um, a community uh, supporting in terms of funding or in terms of, uh, um, you know, any type of moral support. And so it, it really is uh, finding a good balance between um, working with material and with a research that you love that has more um, a transnational scope and uh, somehow engaging that uh, with uh, something that is happening on the ground. So, and going back, and I don't wanna take up too much time, but going back to what everybody was saying in the panel, especially Akash and um, Loredana, uh, really is about unpacking something that, that we have a traditional conventional perception and presenting in, through new eyes with fresh eyes. And so, for example, in my case, uh, they, they are building this huge uh, uh, culinary center. And so, and it's named after an Italian American and we are not part of that project at all. And so how do you, in a positive way, uh, try to engage them and, 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 and enable them to look at you and find that you are indispensable to them uh, to be able to talk about that heritage that revolves around food and uh, um, you know growing and gardening traditions and the habit of inviting the, the community in. So that you have to engage through research, through outreach and make yourself visible. Rosetta, there is an add-on to this question. What is, somebody's asking, what is the Italian component in your lab? Right, the Italian component is not, um, is not a lang linguistic component. Um, and it's, um, as I was saying, is uh, trying to, to draw a parallel between the um, uh, 
the, the, the heritage, the, um, the traditions of uh, growing and gardening uh, of Italian Americans, of diasporic Italians, um, the so-called Dixie Italians, as Jessica Barbata calls them, and uh, in, in, in the tradition of African Americans um, uh, farming and their involvement in farming uh, during, um, you know, in Alabama, in the Jim Crow Alabama. And so trying to find those connections uh, um, and th those parallels. Um, and so that is the, is the component. And also be able to talk about hospitality um, because this center, this culinary center is about hospitality. And so what is hospitality and how it relates to the so-called Southern hospitality that is so much bound into the economy of uh, um, antebellum uh, South. And uh, um, so that is uh, trying to find intersections. Okay. Um, I have another question for Akash. We're making you work really hard today. Uh, the comedy is such an icon. How do your students react to the decolonized Dante? And then there is a second one for Rosetta. So we uh, I'll ask them both at the same time. What advice would you have for those interested in beginning similar initiatives? So, so first I, I would say, yeah. sorry. Uh, I, I would say there's a little bit of a, uh, of a difference uh, in say, if I'm teaching an undergraduate audience that has no exposure whatsoever to Dante, they're, they're reading with fresh eyes as, as I'm urging them to. And, and so these notions are, are, are coming sometimes from their own uh, organic ideas, sometimes from me provoking and, and saying a couple of things. Uh, and, and, and that goes along uh, swimmingly uh, for the most part. In the case of teaching graduate students, uh, sometimes graduate students who have who have been already, uh, you know, studying in Italy, having doctorates from Italy, that that's a little bit more of a uh, of a heavy load, let's say. Uh, and there's there's a great deal of of fun in that uh, in in trying to uh, ask someone who has who has grown with this poem, who has who has read it in a certain way in Liceo Classico, and uh, might be able to to find a, a completely different approach uh, and perspective to something that they thought that they knew. Uh, I have a question for Joseph. Um, uh, that is is asked in Italian, so I am sort of rewording it a little bit. Uh, this person uh, has just begun to start uh, Egyptian migration. Um, oh, no. Have you, uh, Joseph, started to start the Egyptian migration now, recently? Um, or have you studied for a long time the relationship between migra migrant literature and uh, Egyptian migration? Uh, is there a difference between Egyptian migration in the past and now? You can take it the way you want it. Um, <clears throat> it sounds like there are a lot of questions in there. Um, so, I mean, this is one of the problems with, with these categories and labels. And, and I, I actually think I want to respond to this by by going back to the question about that was asked to uh, Akash and say that as modernist and, and contemporary historians and, and or scholars in the humanities and social sciences more broadly, there's often this assumption that our categories are somehow more solid and less complex than early modern contexts. And I think that's a notion that we have to absolutely throw out. Um, so, uh, when I say, or when I, in my, in my brief talk, when I talked about Egyptian or Italian migrants, um, I mean, I'm mainly referring to categories of citizenship or political membership. I mean, uh, Italians in Egypt uh, that were present, although for a long time, mainly after uh, British colonialism, did the community grow and expand. Uh, those are individuals of a of, of variety of origins who hold Italian citizenship um, in one way or another. Uh, and 
Uh, that's what's the, when I said that I wasn't interested necessarily in the identitarian claims, I think that's where it's really interesting because we see how materially different kinds of individuals with, with diverse origins embrace these, these historical materials, these objects and use them as vehicles to move and to migrate. And that lead us to these more complex questions that I think we're all asking today. So, you know, a generation or so later after this, this departure of, of over um, 45,000 Italian, uh, Italians from Egypt, do we get to this moment in which there's a more contemporary uh, migration of Egyptians, uh, largely from the Delta into to Italy. And this happens mostly after the 1970s, after the, the, the economic opening of the country under Sadat. Um, and uh, with, with that, we then get a, a, another iteration of this story that is also shaping the, the, what I call the Mediterranean imaginary, these hopeful migrants. So while they are uh, you know, e Egyptian in the sense that they hold Egyptian political uh, membership and they're, they're citizens of modern Egypt, they're coming from the Delta, uh, they're also drawing upon a repertoire of historical signs in order to understand that migration and to move within that. And I, I, I think that it's important not necessarily or not only to focus on literature. In fact, the studies that do look at these relationships between Egypt and Italy through literature, I think often mix, miss a lot of this complexity that, that is more evocative of pre-modern contexts. And, and, and I don't think that means that those contexts are only pre-modern, but rather as modernists, we've, we've been uh, we've been neglectful at understanding what complexity looks like in the context of the nation state and in the context even of the post-colonial Mediterranean. Rosetta, so hopefully that kind you, of answers. I asked you a question and then I abandoned you. You were supposed to answer right after Akash. I apologize, Shimon. No, Graziella, it's okay. Um, to that person can contact me via email and I'm more than willing to uh, share all the information that I have and uh, guide through the, and give more information, more data about what I have presented. So please contact me personally. Okay, I have one last question that involves you, Rosetta, again. Um, might Maria Montessori's work on gardens and pedagogy be of interest in your project? Uh, no, no so much that uh, it's something called, um, it's a new methodology, it's called, um, uh, I cannot remember now, uh, but no, no, not necessarily the Montessori uh, method, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm so, I cannot remember the, the new methodology. Don't worry. I mean, the person who asked this question is Lucia Reyes, so she can contact you directly and you can uh, dialogue. So we are reaching the end of time. It sounds a little bit apocalyptic, but it's just for this week. We will start again on Monday. Thank you all for attending in such large uh, numbers. And um, I am so excited about this because I'm learning so much. Uh, it makes me feel a little bit uh, uh, like a dinosaur in Italian studies, but, but it's so exciting that I can find different directions in which to go. And have a wonderful weekend. It's two days away, but have a wonderful weekend. Take care all.